Welcome to Walking by Faith. We believe and pray that through this message, you'll experience God in a fresh, powerful way, and that healing will be released over your body today in Jesus' name. For more on this sermon, check out our app or click on the Beyond the Sermon link below. Today, we discover how healing is a part of God's plan for believers and learn how to overcome the obstacles that can hinder its manifestations. Let's explore the power of faith and the reality of God's healing grace in today's message, Unveiling the Power of Healing. I want to talk to start with about a few basic things that we need to talk about whenever we're going to be ministering healing. And it's not that we don't know anything else. I got to thinking about it this morning. Um, when I first became pastor here, I did a full year every Wednesday night on faith and healing. So, so it's not like we don't know anything else. But there's just basic things. And, and even a pro golfer will, will get a coach and they will go back to the basics, to the basics. John Wooden, that great basketball coach, he would literally start out every year saying, this is how you put on your socks. And this is how you tie your shoes. Why? The basics, the basics. All right. So basic number one. God's will is to heal you. In fact, you have to believe that in order to act in faith and receive from God. That healing really is not your idea. It's God's idea. And you're not trying to talk God into doing something. It's something he has already done. The Bible says, by whose stripes you were healed or healing was purchased for you. So, King David, Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. When you become a part of the family of God, when you enter the kingdom of God, there are benefits. That's why, again, David wrote in Psalms 23, he said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Well, I want you to know there's some good stuff on that table. There's peace. There's deliverance. There's healing. There's provision. There's righteousness. He said, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and who heals all of your diseases. That is, David said, one of the benefits of being a part of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When evening had come, they brought unto him many who were demon possessed. He cast out the spirit with a word and healed all who were sick. If you're sick and you had been there, you would have received healing because Jesus healed how many? He healed them all. And God's will for you does not change because of time or geography. If it was his will then, it's his will now. And it says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Isaiah the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Matthew 10 says, when he had called the 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, someone says, well, that was just during Jesus' earthly ministry. But as Jesus, after the resurrection, is Jesus ascending into heaven? In Mark 16, he said, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. The list begins, they will cast out devils. It ends with they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, who is that spoken to? Those who believe. Those who believe in his name. James chapter 5, years after the resurrection. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up. So again, healing Post-resurrection, it's part of the kingdom of God. In fact, again in Matthew, it says this in verse 6. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, when Jesus came, what he announced was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here, it's now, it's available, it is for you. So he gives us a description of part of the kingdom. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you receive, freely give. 
It's a picture of the kingdom. Part of the kingdom of God is healing. In fact, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come near to you, right? Healing, deliverance, they're part of the kingdom. And always remember this, that Jesus is perfect theology. In other words, Jesus is a perfect representation of the will of God. In fact, the psalmist prophesying of Jesus coming said this, I have come to do thy will, O God. Everything Jesus did was the will of God. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says that Jesus is the mirror image of God the Father. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. Everything Jesus did was the will of God. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So healing is the will of God for you. Now, everything that we receive, we receive by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2 Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Now, what grace means is this. What you did not deserve, what you did not work for, what you receive in spite of yourself, not because of yourself. God did not save you and go, ooh, if I could just get them in my family. It was in spite of you, not because of how good, how smart, how intelligent, how holy, how good you were. By grace, which you did not earn, which you do not deserve, in spite of how bad you are, you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, the word saved there, the word sozo, and we'll look at it in just a moment. It doesn't mean just die and go to heaven. Right? It means provision. It means deliverance. It means healing. It means preservation and safety. So, whether it's forgiveness of sins or it's healing, it's by grace. Now, I have literally had people say this to me. Well, why won't God heal me? I work in the nursery. I sing in the choir. I read my Bible. I tithe, and why won't God heal me? I can tell you exactly why. Because you're trying to earn it. That's why. Because God does not heal you because of how good you are. It's by grace. Something you do not deserve, something you did not work for, something you did not earn, something that God does in spite of you. And as soon as you try to earn it, you step out of grace into works. And everything we receive from God is by grace, through faith. You believe he has already done it. He's for you. It's taken care of. You believe that. So sickness, number two, is not from God. John 10, verse 10, Jesus said this, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Again, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Didn't say God made them sick. It said they were oppressed of the devil. Ultimately, sickness and disease came into the world when Satan came into this world, earth. There was no sickness and disease before he came. There will be none after he's gone. I think it's pretty easy to see who the author is. But it says, Jesus healed all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I have had people say things like this to me. They said, well, God's punishing me. God's teaching me. I'm sick for the glory of God. Do you know what? Jesus never told anybody, God's punishing you. Jesus never said to anybody, it's not God's time for you to be healed now. Jesus never told any of that to anyone. Right? That's just religious baloney. All right? That's, that is not what the Word of God teaches. Luke 13, 
verse 10. And he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, was bent over and could no way raise herself up. So this woman has at church. She's in the synagogue. Now, the Bible says that she has a spirit of infirmity. She's bent over. If the doctor had been there, they may have examined her, given her an MRI, would have, but they would have said she has curvature of the spine. And that would have been a proper diagnosis. But the root cause behind that was an evil spirit. Right? And it had been there for 18 years. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you're loosed of your infirmity. And he laid hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. What Jesus taught his disciples, and by the way, the way the disciples learned how to minister healing was by following Jesus. There, there, Jesus healed multitudes of people. But there are 26 individual cases that are talked about in the four Gospels. Individual cases. Now, the disciples are there, and they're watching how Jesus ministers healing to people. That's how they learned how to do it. Most of the time, what we do is we pray and ask God to heal. Right? Um, if you look at the disciples in the book of Acts, they never did that. You look at Jesus' ministry, he did not do that, all right? He commanded sickness to go, all right? And he makes a faith declaration when he's doing ministering to this woman. He says, woman, you are loosed of your infirmity. And then he lays hands on her, all right? And that's the point of contact where she is immediately healed. But there is the declaration most of the time, when we think about healing, we just think, God, I'm praying that you would heal this person. But if you look at the Bible, you look at how Jesus ministered healing, how his disciples ministered healing, they ministered healing through declaration, all right? Through declaration and then through the laying on of his hands or for an act of faith. He said, you are loosed of your infirmity. He laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now, he made the declaration, but the healing did not manifest until the hands were laid on her. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed in them and not on the Sabbath. The Lord then answered and said, hypocrite, doesn't each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman... Being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. I want you to notice a couple of things that Jesus said. First of all, he said this woman ought to be healed. All right? And I want to say this. If you and I are sick, we ought to be healed. And Jesus tells us why. He said to the crowd, why? Because she is a daughter of Abraham. Now, what that means is this. She is under the Abrahamic blessing or covenant. Galatians 3.29 says, if you are Christ, how many are Christ? Then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise or the covenant. Part of the covenant or the promise was healing. That's part of the promise. And so he said, because she's a daughter of Abraham, she's under that covenant and she ought to be healed. You say, well, if it's part of the promise, why doesn't it just happen? Because you have to enforce the kingdom. The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Remember, the devil comes to steal to kill and to destroy. Jesus said he's the father of lies. He will try to keep you from every benefit of the covenant, but you've got to enforce the covenant. So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan is bound 
It wasn't God who was testing her, who was punishing her. She was not suffering for the glory of God. None of that's in the Bible. Right? But as yet is what we've been, many of us have been taught. Be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. So Jesus ministered healing to her. But what I want you to see is the sickness did not come from God. And sickness does not come from God. Before the devil was here, there was no sickness. Once he's gone, there's no sickness. There's no disease. That should make it very, very easy to figure out where does it come from. Right? So healing literally belongs to believers. Just like it, bo- she ought to be healed Believers ought to be healed. The benefits, again, Psalms 103, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Jesus, let me just mention one other verse here before we get into another one of the the episodes of Jesus' healing. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, the gospel is what Jesus did in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Right? That's the good news of what Jesus did, the gospel. It is the power of God. What is the power? The gospel. The message about what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection is the power. Right? The power is not prayer. We believe in prayer, but prayer is not the power. We believe in worship and praise, but worship and praise is not the power. What is the power? The gospel, the message of what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. It is the power of God. So what that means is this, that when you and I believe the message of the gospel, the power that was present in the event when it took place is manifest When you believe the message of the gospel, the gospel, the message of what Jesus did in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension is the power of God, right? Unto salvation to everyone that believes. Jew first, also the Greek. So this is for everybody. You and I, we are not the exception, but it's the power of God unto salvation. By the way, that that Greek word there, the word sozo, Dr. Schofield, the Hebrew scholar, in his notes, says this about the word salvation in Romans 1.16. It includes the ideas of safety, preservation, healing, soundness. Salvation is the great inclusive word of the gospel, gathering into itself all the redemptive acts and processes such as justification, redemption, grace, propitiation, imputation, forgiveness, sanctification, glorification. What it's saying is this, that everything that God does for you and I is tied to what Jesus did in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And that message, when you believe that message, the power that was present when God raised Christ from the dead becomes present for you, available to you, When you believe the message. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 21. Then Jesus went from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now now he's actually kind of taking a roundabout way to where he's going. And he actually leaves the, the land of Israel and goes into what would be called Gentile territory. And behold, a woman of Cana came from that region and cried out to him saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Now, son of David is a messianic term. And and she is literally coming. How can we say this? And she is claiming that Abrahamic covenant. The one that got the woman in Luke 13 healed. Jesus, she ought to be healed because she's a child of Abraham. Well, that's what she's saying. But she's not a child of Abraham. She said, my... My daughter is severely demon-possessed, but he answered her not a word. Jesus ignores her. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I'm not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm sent to those who are part 
of the Abrahamic covenant. And she came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. I'm I, I just going to mention that worship touches the heart of God. It touches his heart. But he answered and he said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. He called her a dog. How many of you might have been offended? Jesus called her a dog. Now, if you look at those 26 instances of Jesus healing people, what you will find is again and again, Jesus does something to get them to exercise faith. And that's what Jesus is doing right here. He's getting her to exercise her faith. But notice, she's looking for healing in what Jesus called it. He called it the children's bread. What is healing? The children's bread. Remember, he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. And I want you to know there's bread on the table. There's healing on the table. There's peace on the table. There's deliverance on the table. There's right standing with God on the table. But she said, Lord, even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And listen to this. Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great, the Greek, mega, mega. All right. Jesus only compliments two people on their faith in the entire New Testament. Both of them are Gentiles. Neither of them were under the Abrahamic covenant. In fact, this is the greatest compliment that Jesus gave anyone in the New Testament. He said, mega is your faith. I like to just call her mega faith woman. All right. Now, you may not realize this, but Jesus said this. He said, when the son of man returns, will he even find faith on the earth? You know what God's looking for? He's looking for faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, to connect with God, to receive from God. It is always through faith. Great, mega is your faith. Let it be to you as you have desired. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, in Mark's gospel, we find Jesus goes to his hometown And it said he could do no mighty work there. Mark 6, 5. He could do no mighty work there. It didn't say Jesus wouldn't. It said Jesus couldn't. Now, again, that might mess with your theology. But whenever the Bible messes with our theology, we we should throw our theology away. And get some Bible theology. It says Jesus could not do any mighty work because of their unbelief. And although he's anointed with the Holy Spirit and power to heal, he cannot because of their unbelief. Their unbelief is keeping the power of God from flowing and bringing healing. So Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. He comes down, and there's a man down there who has brought his son who has seizures to his disciples. And he asked the disciples to heal the boy. And the Bible says they could not. They could not. Now, one thing I want you to see right away is the disciples ministered and there was no healing. Does that mean it was not God's will? No, Jesus comes and brings healing. It was God's will the whole time. So we need to remember Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus perfectly manifests God's will. So then when Jesus comes, the man sees Jesus and says, hey, I brought my son and your your disciples haven't been able to help him. And then this is what the man said to Jesus. He said, if you can help us, have mercy on us. If you can do anything, help us. And this is what Jesus said. Listen, he said, if you can believe, if you can believe. All things are possible to him who believes. That man tried to say, Jesus, it's just up to you. What's going to happen? But Jesus said, no, it's not up to me. He said, it's up to you. You see, when people are prayed for, often they're like, well, let's see what they've got. You know, we can help you. 
We can put our faith with you. But if, if you're not believing, it's not going anywhere. In Nazareth, Jesus could do no mighty work. Here Jesus said, if you can believe. Now, listen to what the man says. He says, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but help thou my unbelief. So here's what I want you to catch. It's possible to have faith and believe and also have unbelief at the same time. This man had faith, but he also had unbelief. Now, when that happens, what it's like is it's like you've got two horses or two teams of horses, one faith pulling over here, but then you've got two horses of unbelief pulling over here. And you know where they go because they're attached? They go nowhere. So the unbelief has to be dealt with. So there's two ways that unbelief is dealt with in the New Testament. In Mark 6, Jesus could do no miracle because of their unbelief, and he went about teaching. Right? One of the ways you deal with unbelief is by hearing the truth, because faith comes by hearing. So Jesus delivers this boy, and then the disciples come to Jesus, and they say, why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. Now, they had ministered to a lot of people and seen healing. But for some reason in this case, maybe because this boy fell down and began to, to foam at the mouth. And when they saw that, there was unbelief. But Jesus said, because of your unbelief. And then listen to what Jesus said. This kind, not this kind of demon, but this kind of unbelief does not come out except by prayer and fasting. Right? Teaching and then prayer and fasting. To deal with what? Our unbelief. Let me just close with this. Uh, there's, there's really a couple kinds of unbelief. There's, there's literally a natural unbelief, which is just ignorance. All right? Just ignorance about the subject of healing. All right? Then there's religious unbelief, which is false teaching. I remember years ago, a couple that began to attend our church because where the church they were attending, the pastor preached a sermon and the title was six reasons God won't heal you. You know, when you sit under that, when you sit under God made you sick, when you sit under God's testing you, God's punishing you, you're doing, you're suffering for the glory of God. That type of religious teaching produces unbelief. And then there's a third type of unbelief, which is experiential. I've, I've had people come and say, would you pray for me? Yeah, and I said, we're going to pray and we're believing God. If we, if we minister, you're going to be healed. Well, my aunt had this and she died. You know, you look, at, you look at experience and it produces unbelief. But all of those are dealt with through teaching and prayer and fasting. You know, the most important thing about anybody's life the most important question you need to answer is, am I right with God? Am I on my way to heaven? Jesus made this statement. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. You see, G Jesus is saying, all the good things I could ever do could not make me right with God. All the good things you could do could not make you right with God. He's saying, I'm the only way. I will die on the cross. I will shed my blood. I will pay for your sins. I will rise from the dead and defeat death. So the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever, that is you, will call on the name of the Lord. We're going to call on his name the way the Bible tells us to. And then it says, we'll be saved. If you will pray this prayer and believe these things that we're saying, when we say amen, you're going to be right with God. So would you please repeat this out loud from your heart? Just say, oh God. I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe that his blood paid for my sins. I believe that he rose again, victorious over death, over sin, and over the devil. And I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I hold nothing back. I receive Jesus as my King, as my Lord, and my only Savior. I thank you. You've heard my prayer that my past, it's gone. And I'm now a part of your kingdom today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you prayed that prayer, God heard your prayer and you are right with God. Now, again, God's goal is that we keep on growing spiritually and become more and more like Jesus. So I wrote a book to help you keep growing spiritually. All the information to get that book is right there on your screen. Please avail yourself of it. Thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. Congratulations on taking this incredible step with Jesus. We're excited for this new journey that you're beginning. If you have any questions or want to learn more, our team is here to help you in every step of the way. To get your free copy of Pastor's book, Your New Life, click on the link in the description or download the Walking by Faith app. This book is filled with practical guidance to help you live a life filled with faith. Don't wait. Claim your free copy today. Light a spark of hope. Your generous support fuels Walking by Faith's mission to share God's message globally. Every gift, big or small, ignites hope in lives all around the world. To give, click on the giving link in the description below or click on the giving icon in our app. Thank you for your unwavering support in spreading the message of hope and healing through God's Word. If you're looking for more healing resources, we've got you covered. You can find all of our healing materials on our app, perfect for listening to scripture on the go and overcoming unbelief. Recently, we heard from a man diagnosed with cancer who found healing through daily listening to Pastor Dwayne's healing confessions on our app. Download the Walking by Faith app today and start exploring all of our resources. Let's overcome unbelief together and experience the power of God's healing touch. If you've received healing, we'd love to celebrate with you. And if you're in need of prayer, please don't hesitate. Reach out to our prayer team by leaving a comment below or message us on WhatsApp at 616-370-2404. Remember, healing is a journey. Keep persevering in faith and trust in God's timing. We'll see you next time.